There's a new zero-day Windows exploit out in the wild today. It allows an attacker to execute arbitrary PowerShell commands on your system, so it's fairly severe. There's no patch available yet, but there are manual steps that you can take, and I'll fix and protect my own system as you watch, all today in Dave's Garage. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And yesterday, I released an episode on backdoors and windows, including how they might differ from an unpatched zero-day exploit. And coincidentally, this morning we're facing a new zero-day attack. They've detected exploits in the wild for this one, and the Chinese government is reported to be making use of it already, so you don't want to miss the details, especially how to avoid it and how to protect yourself. Before we take a deep dive into the specifics of today's Folina exploit, let's take a few seconds to talk about what it really means to have a zero-day exploit out there in the wild and what the implications for today are. A zero-day exploit refers to an attack that nobody saw coming. Not the public, not the antivirus vendors, not hackers, no one. Unless given advance notice, Microsoft wouldn't know about it either. And then at some point, a hacker or a security expert will somehow discover the exploit and one of two things will happen. If it's a growing adult, like a white hat hacker, they report it to the software vendor and or to the CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, whose responsibility it is to respond to such threats. Today's zero day was, as far as I can tell at this time, initially discovered and reported by someone called Crazy Man with the Shadow Chaser Group. They then reported it to Microsoft. As I noted, there are already exploits out in the wild, so whether Crazy Man was the first person to have found the exploit or whether he found evidence of it being used by an attacker is not clear to me at this time. According to some reports, Crazy Man notified Microsoft back in April, so there's been a fair bit of time gone by for people to develop attacks using it. If it's a black hat attacker, they could do one of several things with it. They could squirrel it away for a later date, or they might try to sell it for Bitcoin on the dark web to another hacker or even a foreign agency that has a need or desire to infiltrate user systems. But what use is a zero-day exploit attack to an attacker? Well, there are actually three main categories of exploits that we need to know about before we can look at how these exploits are used. The first is the application exploit, and these are the least dangerous. You must first have that application on your system before you're really at any risk. If you do, such an exploit might allow remote code to be executed on your machine, but the good news is that it will execute in the security context of the application and not of administrator. The problem is that the vast majority of Windows users, even in the year 2022, still seem to operate the machine as administrator. Microsoft has tempered the risks significantly with user account control, but most people can still likely be socially engineered into clicking the continue button in response to some reasonable prompt. Because most bread and butter Windows users spend their days trying to get past annoying dialogues that interrupt their workflow, not carefully reading them to understand security implications. The second type of exploit is a remote code execution exploit in the operating system itself, or far more likely, some component that's installed and included with the operating system. The attack surface is much, much larger in this case, as is the number of exposed users, because it would impact all Windows users, not just those who had a particular application installed. The third and worst kind of exploit is the silent but deadly remote code execution exploit with privilege escalation. Contrary to what you might think, these are actually incredibly rare, which is very fortunate because they can be incredibly dangerous. These are the ones that the NSA hunts for, as do the Israelis and the Russians and the Chinese state agencies. That's because such an exploit allows a remote attacker to take complete control of the machine remotely and do everything and anything with it. And by anything, I mean anything. In the case of Stuxnet, such an exploit was used by the Israelis, perhaps with US assistance, to attack Iranian nuclear computers that controlled the centrifuges used for refining uranium. That's a super cool story in itself, fit for its own episode, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel so that you don't miss it. Now, they also had to hack the firmware on the machines themselves, by which I mean the centrifuges, but once that was accomplished, they were able to break into Windows, then break into the centrifuge controllers, overspeed the centrifuges, all while lying back to the operators about the true speeds. The centrifuges would actually literally self-destruct while reporting that everything was awesome right up to the last second. So that's an extreme case, one of the very, very few where a zero-day exploit has been used to cause physical destruction. It could be worse, however. A Russian state hacker might shut down all of the computers in Ukraine, or vice versa. Or China could launch such an attack on Taiwan. In fact, according to the security analysts at Proofpoint, today's new exploit is already being used by the Chinese government. An insane criminal hacker could blackmail the entire world, in theory. Perhaps they could lock and encrypt every machine in the world while they held out for some incredible ransom. Or they could just format all of the boot drives. You never know. 
Of course, it wouldn't be every machine in the world necessarily, or even every Windows machine. Just the ones connected to the internet that can pick up the attack. With that little introduction out of the way, we can turn our attention to the newest exploit known as Folina. Microsoft has just notified the world of a vulnerability in the Microsoft Support Diagnostic Tool, which is part of Microsoft Office. So on the plus side, it's one of the least hazardous types of exploits, the application remote execution exploit. According to Microsoft, a remote code execution vulnerability exists when MSDT is called using the URL protocol from a calling application such as Word. An attacker who successfully exploits this vulnerability can then run arbitrary code with the privileges of the calling application. The attacker can then install programs, view, change, or delete data, create new accounts in the context allowed by the user's rights, and so on. The Microsoft version of the advisory does not single out Microsoft Office, but as I understand it, the MSDT is part of Office. My best guess from what I've been able to determine so far is that the exploit is actually in the protocol or its handler, but that it requires Office to be present to spawn the processes and thus doesn't do much of anything interesting if you don't have Office. And so, thus, if you do not now and have never had Office on the machine, you might be okay, but I can't say for sure yet. And besides, Office is almost as ubiquitous as Windows itself, so it may not matter that much in the end. Initial reports are that this exploit can completely bypass Windows Defender. It works without elevated privileges, and it does not require that Office macros are turned on. In fact, while the early exploits I've seen involve Word documents being sent inside of zip files, the safety of Office protected mode is absent if and when that document is then formatted as rich text instead of doc format. So it sounds to me like if you open an infected Word document in RTF format from a zip file, you're infected. If you ever receive a Word file and email, you've got to be exceptionally careful. Behind the scenes, an infected document uses the Word template feature to download an HTML file from a remote server, which in turn triggers the MSTD protocol, which is where the vulnerability can be found. Fixing it today requires editing the registry. If you're in any way unsure of your ability to do so accurately, please consult a knowledgeable friend or expert for assistance, as you can truly bork your system if you do the wrong thing inside a registry editor, as in it won't boot. So, to get started, launch regedit and browse down to hkeyclasses root slash ms-msdt. This is where the registry entries are stored that control and enable the vulnerable protocol handler in the msdt stack. So, to protect ourselves for now, we're going to back up those keys and then delete them entirely. When we're done, nobody will be able to use an MSDT protocol link. What the full implications of that are, I don't know entirely, but I've never seen one of these URLs before and my office seems completely unaffected by the change. This is the action that Microsoft is recommending and worst case, we'll make a backup of the key that can be restored later. First, we'll right click on the key and pick export. Then we'll save the key as MSDT backup. Where you save it and what you call it really do not matter, but be sure to remember both. Now I'm going to right click on the ms-msdt key and pick delete. Once I bless the confirmation dialog, it will remove that key and no one should be able to execute msdt protocol links going forward from here. Then if Microsoft releases a patch and you want to restore this functionality for some reason, you can restore the key that you saved through the backup. You simply double click on the backup file and it will load itself into registry editor and enter the keys into the registry for you to put them back. Brevity is wit, so if along the way you found today's episode to be any combination of entertaining or informative, or if you'd like to see the upcoming NSA key episode, I'd be honored if you'd consider leaving a like and subscribing to my channel. Now, if you're wondering why my shop is suddenly a wash and white, uh, as regular viewers and subscribers know, I've normally got the windows colors behind me and lots of other stuff. Oh, what, you never noticed that I had yellow, blue, and green windows and a big red toolbox? Too subtle? Anyway, this is actually a bay window facing south, and to control the light, I've always had the windows covered with white oak film and then added accent LEDs on the inside and so on. But as the film aged, I was getting some light bleed around the edges and you could actually see the LED colors from outside at night and it needed to be redone by somebody more qualified. So I found a good local window tint company, tore the whole set down yesterday and they came out to do the windows. I plan to be back up the next day, but as you can see, their darkest film is not very dark. So I'm in the middle of either having them come back and redo it or redoing it myself with stuff from Amazon, depending on whether or not they can find the right professional film to do it with. Suffice to say, I wasn't planning on filming today, but then Foldina happened and here we are. Now, if you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. 
This little chair will be waiting for one of you. And a rocking chair for another who likes to rock. And a big armchair for two to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage.